Nowhere has the UN's failure been more consistent and more outrageous than it is than its bias against our close ally, Israel. In the General Assembly session just completed, the UN adopted 20 resolutions against Israel and only six targeting the rest of the world's countries combined. That's Nikki Haley at her confirmation hearings. She is now Donald Trump's ambassador to the United Nations, taking a very pro-Israel approach, a marked uh, departure from Barack Obama's approach. Um, but other than Nikki Haley, how has Donald Trump done in terms of Israel and the Middle East? Has he kept the promise of being pro-Israel, moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, backing off of bullying Israelis about their construction of settlements? Joining us now in studio to talk about this is our friend Dr. Daniel Pipes up here from the Middle East Forum. Great to see you again. You too, Ezra. Well, welcome to our humble studios. Um, I like what Nikki Haley has done so far. She's She has kept talking about this anti-Israel bias even now that she's within the bosom of the UN. So I don't think she's been co-opted by the career diplomats and, and bureaucrats. How has Trump done on the other uh, aspects? She's been fantastic. The other aspects are not so good. Um, when you look at the most important issue of all, the Iran deal, the JCPOA, uh, Trump called it the worst deal in history, but nothing in over two months has happened, nothing at all. What Iran. could happen? What could he do? What should he do? What did he promise to do? He never exactly said what he would promise to do, but he called it very bad things. And the striking thing about the Iran deal is that it's not a deal. It's a one-sided uh, proposal by the United States. No one else signed it, just the U.S. government. No other government, not the Iranian, not the other five mm. states. So he could simply end it. He could uh, change the enforcement of it. He could do all sorts of things, but he hasn't. Nothing's happened, at least publicly that we know of. As his uh, rhetoric changed, I see Iran's rhetoric is getting tougher in the Persian Gulf. Has Trump or uh, his Secretary of State said a different kind of language? I noticed a change in language with North Korea. Uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Rex Tillerson, has basically said there's no more fruit to be found in negotiation. Have they said the same about uh, Iran? No, but they have talked tougher, which isn't hard because the Obama administration was very appeasing. So yes, there's tougher talk, and I think the Iranians are being a bit more cautious, but the main thrust of the policy was to get rid of the deal, and it's still there. Uh, you mentioned the move of the embassy to Jerusalem. Mike Pence just reaffirmed it, but in fact, nothing has happened. And you mentioned the Israeli building of housing units in the West Bank. There, it looks like more continuity than change. And more importantly, on Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, it looks like at this point that it's no real change. Furthermore, a number of the most key personnel in the National Security Council and the State Department are in place and look like they have more power than ever. So overall, other than the United Nations, looks like continuity rather than change. And this points to something rather interesting that I noticed way back in the early 90s, that the politicians and diplomats in the United States, and presumably elsewhere, who talk warmly about Israel receive great thanks for that. And they don't have to actually do anything. In fact, they can do things which are anathema otherwise. Whereas politicians who are not warm and fuzzy with Israel don't get any credit for even when they do things that are good. So, for example, Barack Obama had, the, from Israel's point of view, the best ever weapons uh, delivery, but he got no credit for it because he was nasty. Uh, Trump, because he and his team have been pro in words, are getting credit even when they actually haven't done anything. Yeah, it's only been a couple of months. Granted. And obviously, you know, build the wall, uh, the visiting and, and the immigration issues, the suspension, those are pretty core Trump promises. And in their own way, they're to a foreign policy benefit for Israel because they name terrorism, they call it Islamic, that, you know, the, the use of the word Islamic or Islamist or political Islam has been said more in the last two, three months by the U.S. administration than in the last 10 years. Yeah, but again, it's words rather than actions. It's talking about radical Islamic terrorism, to be sure, a step forward. 
But the two efforts to control immigration have both failed. Well, that's at the, f the feet of, of judges. Perhaps the, the executive orders could be more finely crafted, and I think eventually he will succeed. But do you think, what do you think the time limit is? I mean, you say VP Pence reiterated uh, uh, America's plan to move the embassy. I trust that was the a APEC co convention that's on right now. How long uh, before people start calling him on that promise? It's just been a couple, three months. I think so long as he makes the right sounds, has the right tone, people give him a lot of time. From the pro-Israel point of view, the key is the right music. The words are secondary. If you call Israel good things and talk about the strength of the American-Israeli uh, relationship, then you have a lot of credit that take you a long way. You know, we just had a, a mission to Israel. We took five or six of our team, and I had been to Israel before, but no one else on our team did. It was a real eye-opener. The one thing, I, I didn't think I would learn a lot because I had been there before, mm -hmm. but the one thing I, I learned that really struck me, and let me run this by you. Our guide said that in the total modern history, like the last century of Arab-Israeli conflict, all the wars combined, all the terrorism combined, the total death toll on both sides, he said, and you can correct me if this is wrong, was less than 100,000. Mm -hmm. Now that's still an enormous tragedy, every one of those is a tragedy, mm -hmm. But compare that just to the last six months in Syria, yeah. or compare it to what ISIS is doing in northern Iraq, compare it to any other crisis in a hundred years, less than a hundred thousand casualties. And, and I'm not mm -hmm. being condescending towards right. the gravity of that, but I'm thinking, this is not the world's greatest problem. This is not the world's most intractable problem. This is not, I mean, Donald Trump said this is the deal to end all deals to solve mm -hmm. this problem. No, it ain't. In fact, it's a, it, it's like a, a, a fake or a distraction or a placebo focus on Israel and lay off of Saudi Arabia, Iran, ISIS, all these other countries. Do you think Trump's sort of ignoring Israel is a hidden plus? Because he's not going to obsess over it like Bill Clinton did, not going to try and push Israel into a deal like other presidents have. First, two, two points. First, uh, you're absolutely right about the numbers. I co-authored an article with Professor Heinzen of uh, Germany some years ago in which we found I think the total number of fatalities at that point was 53,000, not the whole century, but since World War II, and it numbered, if I remember correctly, number 49 on the fatalities of international wars. So yes, very few compared to other conflicts. So in terms of conflicts, it's minor. Fatalities, it's minor compared to so many others. But I do think it is the ultimate deal in the sense that this is the most complex and intractable international question. There are so many parties involved, including the great powers and the regional powers and the Islamic states and the Jewish community and the uh, other religious communities. It's, it, is, it is the ultimate uh, the ultimate prize to get a Nobel. There's nothing comparable to it. There's nothing as complex and, un, and long lasting. As for Trump not focusing on it, I'm not sure that he won't because he sees himself as the man who is the art of the deal author and he has said this is, this is the one to broker. So uh, he's got other things on the plate now as you pointed out, the immigration, the wall, the health care that didn't work, the taxation, education, and so forth. But I think it, it is a luring prospect to solve this. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if he turns his attention to this at some point. And I also wouldn't be surprised if he turns against Israel as the intractable side, because that is what happens. It happens inevitably that uh, look at Jimmy Carter or uh, Barack Obama, that they make these efforts and they get frustrated because the Israelis don't give more. Because there's this permanent belief, enduring belief, that if the Israelis only gave something more, then the Palestinians would relent and stop being rejectionist and everything would be fine. So I, I'm worried. Last question. Um, I see criticism of Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner, Trump's daughter and son-in-law because they have an unusual relationship with the president, they have security clearance, they sit in on meetings. Um, I find that, I mean, I know, we all know that Kushner and Ivanka 
were parts of Donald Trump's business empire, and they're trusted counselors to him. It, it's not surprising to me that he would want his trusted counselor. It's not like Chelsea Clinton tagging along to mom or dad, who she was just a family member and not a deeply engaged advisor. Kushner's uh, a, an observant Jew, Ivanka converted. They, they seem to identify in that way. They have some ties to Israel. Do you think that that they are an important source of, of advice on Israel? And if so, how would you classify this, them on the Israeli issue spectrum? Or spectrum? Would they be right wing? Would they be left wing? Uh, they're in America. Are they peace now types? Are they the coup types? Let me extend your question to also include David Friedman, his bankruptcy lawyer, who's now been confirmed as U.S. Ambassador to Israel, and Jason Greenblatt, who is the President's Special Representative for International Negotiations, who is a Manhattan real estate lawyer. So there are four people now who uh, have no history of involvement in uh, Israeli, Palestinian, or other negotiations who are rank amateurs, who bring the freshness of amateurs and yet the inexperience of amateurs. Uh, I don't know exactly all their views. The only one we really know is Friedman, who has a history of writing about it and who is very much on the Likud side of the spectrum. Uh, but the others don't really know Greenblatt. What we heard about his negotiations in Jerusalem and Ramallah suggested that he's fitting into the same old put pressure on Israel and placate the Palestinians. The daughter and son-in-law, I don't know what their views are. Overall, I worry about this lack of experience. There is a, there is a theme in American history, going back to World War I, of presidents appointing people who have no knowledge of a topic with the idea being that they're unbiased and they will bring fresh eyes to it. It has never worked. It has always led to um, down rabbit holes. Uh, I would rather have people who have been doing this for a while. You know, if you went, if you went for heart surgery, would you want someone who's never done anything like this before? Would you prefer someone who's been practicing for a while? I worry about um, f freelancing with amateurs. I, uh, there's a lot, a lot of experience in this area. It's a very complex topic, as I emphasized before. I worry people wandering in and, and, and taking it up and being sudden experts on it. Well, we'll keep in touch in the months ahead. It's still early days. Very early. And the only substantive sign I see is Nikki Haley. Everything else is a, a possibility or a prospect or a process. But I think we'll probably know before the end of the year. Yeah, the UN is great. The rest, I worry about. Yeah. Dr. Daniel Pipes, Middle East Forum, great to see you. Thanks for coming into the good studio. Good in person. Hey, if you like that, sign up for my show every day. Click on the screen to subscribe.